But now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, our chief medical uh, correspondent, editor, and that's Dr. Nancy Snyder. Nancy. Thank you, Tom. Hi, everybody. And just to prove that all roads do, in fact, lead to Omaha, my mother, hi, Tom. <laughs> um, my mother and Warren Buffett shared uh, an English teacher, Miss Trotter, and she said to my mother one day, you know, that little Warren Buffett, he turned out okay. So everybody has their best favorite teacher. Well, from teaching in those phenomenal philanthropists to the coolest science you're going to see in a long time, today we're going to talk about the pre-K brain. And a lot of the great science has just been found in medicine in one place, right here, this brain. And we're going to start to sink our teeth, our mental teeth, into that so we can understand it. So today, right now, we're going to take you to brand new territory, science you've not read about, Science that's on the cutting edge, science that you haven't seen on television, but the first time you're going to see it right here as part of Education Nation. This is not something you've seen in a textbook, but you're going to see it right here because you're going to learn why in those first 2,000 days development is so uniquely magical. When why from zero to 2,000 days, the human brain is wired to learn in creative ways. Our first presenter has played a major role in demonstrating how early exposure to language actually alters the brain, and the spectacular images that she is going to show you this morning are going to be revealed here for the very first time. She's the co-director of the University of Washington's Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, Dr. Patricia Cool. Patricia? Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, Education Nation. Are you ready to see first in the world images of a real baby brain and watch that brain change as the baby reaches the age of five? If the United States is serious about the commitment to make transformational change in our K-12 education system, we will have to take seriously the images that you see today because it's going to show you what happens before children get to school. We are, my colleagues and I, here to help explain why the first 2,000 days of the child's life are critical. What you see here, if we can roll that video, is the kind of activity that's producing architecture in the brain. The child's brain is activated as, can you roll the video please? Activated. Let's try doing this. All right. Here we go. The child's brain's architecture is grown as children are involved in activities like this, as they manipulate the world to see how it works, as they interact with loving parents, as they negotiate the social world with each other, as they create playful and imagined worlds that live in their heads. These kinds of activities, listening to language and interacting with people, are creating the white matter tracks and the speedy processing in the brain that leads to thought and creative ideas. The child's brain in the first 2,000 days is waiting for this activity. If this activity doesn't occur, the brain doesn't work its magic in the way that it does under normal circumstances. What we need to do is to look at this little child because this baby's brain is going to be uh, shown in the video images that follow. Now, there are two things that scientists have known for quite some time. The first is that the brain grows at a very rapid speed. At the age of two years, at the age of one year, the brain is 70% its typical adult size. By the age of five years, it's 92% complete. What's going on in the brain? How is this growth occurring? Part of what's occurring is the growth of synapses. We are born with 100 billion neurons, virtually all we're going to have. But as you can see, the connections wiring them together are not there. What happens in the early years between zero and six is a rapid proliferation of the synapses. At the peak of this development, that 100 billion neurons in the baby brain each has 15,000 synapses. That's three times more than you and I have. Just do the math. But between that early period and puberty, the brain prunes its synapses to get rid of the ones that it doesn't need. The brain prunes for the same reason that we prune a rosebush, to strengthen the connections that remain. 
So as the baby prunes, the remaining connections get stronger. But we can now go beyond these images of the size of the brain and the synapses. We can begin to look at the baby brain itself, the surface of the brain. Now here's our little tyke, she's nine months old. We can actually use very safe, non-invasive imaging to look at her brain surface. You can see it's about 500 grams, typical for a nine-monther. All the lobes are in place and everything looks good. Modern tools are allowing us to look inside even further than the brain's surface so that we can see the growth of white matter. White matter is the stuff that covers the neural axons to make the speed of transmission very, very fast. So the growth of white matter in the baby brain is extremely important. So let's look again at our nine-monther and look at the white matter in her brain. It's occupying one-third of her brain. At the age of five, it's two-thirds of the brain is white matter. And you can see for comparison's sake, the adult brain is very full of white matter. Now let me stop and tell you something about what we can do now with the tools of modern imaging. We can look at 116 different areas, small areas in the baby brain, and relate the growth of white matter to the environment that that child lives in. So we've shown in my lab that the degree of growth in white matter between six and nine months of age depends on how many words that child hears at home, especially the diversity of words, the complexity of sentences, how much the baby is read to. We are literally growing the white matter when we talk to and interact with children. But looking at individual areas of the brain isn't enough because what's interesting about brains is the cortical dynamics. It's the firing of all the neurons together that create ideas and creative thinking. So we want to get beyond the white matter. We need to see how brain dynamics, how do areas of the brain communicate with one another. And I've got a very simple example. Let's say that your cell phone rings and your immediate concern is who's talking and what they're saying. Turns out that two different parts of the brain are working on this. Your right hemisphere cares about who it is and what kind of a mood they're in. The left side of your brain is concerned with the sounds and the words and the sentences and is trying to work out the meaning. Now you'd think that these two areas would work independently until they figured it out and then communicate. But no, microsecond by microsecond, the information from each side is connecting across a big fiber track, the superhighway in the brain called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the largest, fastest uh, transmission of information across these two brain areas. With a new technology called tractography, we can now look at the fiber tracks in the brain. And we can look at the fiber tracks in a very little baby to see how this transmission is occurring. So let's look again at our little nine-monther and look at the fiber tracks, stunning fiber tracks that connect all to her corpus callosum. All the blue areas are very strong fiber tracks, but the pink ones are even faster. The pink ones represent those with the fastest, most myelinated uh, connections. So you see a little bit of pink there, and when it turns around to the corpus callosum, you'll see that very small bit of pink. But you can see that fiber track connecting the two areas of the brain. At the age of five, look at the pink. The pink is huge, and the fiber track has grown, and it's virtually all pink. A lot of bandwidth in your five-year-old. And the adult, of course, it's more complex. A huge pink fiber track connecting the right side of the brain with the left side of the brain, so it stays in touch. What you see here is wiring of the brain, stunning changes between that early nine-monthers brain and that five-year-old brain heading towards school with a brain that's ready to go. Now there's a particular fiber track that's really, really important for learning to talk and learning to read. It connects two areas of the brain that are responsible for language. One area of the brain called Wernicke's area is for listening and understanding. Another area of the brain called Broca's area is responsible for talking, for understanding the grammatical sentences you're about to produce. It's also involved in social interaction and very important for reading. Can we see this fiber track in little ones? And the answer is yes. Here's our baby again. Here's her brain. There's Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Can we see the track connecting them at nine months of age? And the answer, yes. It's very thick, it's very complete, connecting really well. Five-year-old brain. Let's look at the change in Broca's and Wernicke's areas for listening and talking and the fiber connection 
has grown greater still, and it's more deeply embedded in the two areas. Now, just for comparison, look at your brain. Broca's area, Wernicke's area, and a very, very thick fiber connection with tentacles reaching out everywhere that's connecting uh, your listening area to your uh, speaking area. It's absolutely stunning to see fiber tracks in this shape in a nine-monther before any first words have been produced. So what I've shown you is that there's a lot of hardware in place. The white matter is there. Beautiful fiber tracks have been formed. Individual tracks connecting Wernicke's area and Broca's area. But so far, I haven't shown you that it works. So if you're an engineer and you build airplanes, you can admire the structure of an airplane on the ground. It has its bolts and its nuts in the right place, and you say it's a gorgeous thing. But until you take it up in the air and see it fly, you don't know that it really works. We feel the same way about the baby brain. We want to see that brain in action. Fortunately, we have a new set of tools. This is a brand new machine that allows us to look inside the brains of individuals at all ages. It's completely safe and harmless. Magnetoencephalography, MEG for short. Uh, the technology in this machine contains squid devices, superconducting quantum interference devices, 306 of them in that helmet. When you sit under that helmet, which looks like a hairdryer from Mars, it's completely safely recording the energy level at the neurons changing the magnetic fields as the brain does its work. So we are the first in the world in Seattle to put babies in an MEG machine. And you can see that this baby is totally comfortable. She can move. We're tracking her little head with pellets in a cap. We always know where Broca's area is in that brain. Now I want you to watch really carefully because what I'm going to show you now is what this baby brain looks like when we talk to the baby. So watch carefully. I think you can expect where we might see the activity. But here's her brain on at the birth of a word. What she does is light up Wernicke's area, the listening area, and then immediately after, Broca's area lights up, the social areas light up. She hasn't produced a single word, but she's getting ready to talk back. She knows she's in a social situation and she wants to go. Now the smallest little blob you see there, that shows the activity of a half million neurons activated at once. Imagine the potential. We can watch these areas of the brain develop. Your baby's brain, its tracks, its fiber tracks, gloriously showing the corpus callosum and the piece de resistance, the activity in the baby brain. The potential is limitless. We can look at babies developing. We can apply these technologies safely to children with developmental disabilities, such as autism, dyslexia, fragile X, or in children who have not had wonderful learning opportunities at the beginning of their lives. These appear to be biomarkers for future development. Children who show lots of activity to words and sentences early can be shown to develop words faster to the age of three, and their reading readiness is better at the age of five. There are two messages that are important here to keep in mind. The first is that early learning and brain development is rocket science. It is the frontier of new science. We will be able to apply this not only to children as they prepare for school, but children in school to understand mathematical reasoning, language and literacy, empathy and compassion, creative thinking. Uh, we will be able to improve, I think, the way we educate our children. It should revolutionize education as we know it. And the second message is a little more practical. The next time you're engaged in a conversation with a baby and anything or anyone tries to interrupt that activity, I want you to say, stop. I'm building a brain here. It's the most important thing in the world. Thank you. Patricia, thank you. Very cool stuff. Which raises then the next question of how do you take the cool science and all those amazing neuronal connections that Patricia talked about and turn that into information? How do you make those connections real? Well, our next presenter has done just that. He knows because he's shown that babies are not just blank slates. In fact, they're born ready and hungry to be able to make these connections. They're hungry for the information and how they get that information may and well surprise you. He was the first person in the world to show that these babies, in their first few moments of life, 
are soaking up things already, setting up that brain for its maturity. And he'll show you how they learn then for the rest of their lives. Please welcome the director, the co-director of the University of Washington Institute for Learning and Brain Science, Dr. Andrew Meltzoff. Andrew? Thank you, Nancy, and hello, Education Nation. Today, I want to try show you that children are literally born to learn. They want to become like us, desperately watch our behavior, imitate it, and in so doing, become little members of the culture. The babies uh, imitate behaviors and they do so in ways that are very interesting. I want to show you this, la this film. When Alan Alda came to my laboratory, we put beads in a cup. The child was too young to give verbal directions to. She simply watched what we did and imitated and was happy at doing so. Then I took a camping cup and turned it over, squashed it with my hand, she looked at the cup, at the person, at the cup, and then did the same thing. I gave Alan Alda a toy to pull apart. He pulled it apart, put it back together. The baby looked at the toy, pulled it apart. Good pop. Then I asked Alda to do a very unusual action. I asked him to touch his head to a panel. The baby had never seen such a thing. Do you want to turn? And she imitated. When in Seattle, do as the Seattleites do. This shows the power of early learning, and I think it shows that teaching and learning doesn't just begin in elementary school. It doesn't just begin in first grade. But as the children are too young to talk and they're leaning forward across the high chair and watching what we do, copying it, trying to absorb it and become members of the culture. But imitation doesn't only start in toddlerhood. Here is a 19-hour-old baby in a hospital setting looking up at a face. The adult shows a poking out his tongue. The baby's little eyes converge at the tongue protrusion. Then she responds with poking out her tongue by herself. 19 hours old. The adult opens the mouth. The baby's eyes again converge on the target. And she responds with a mouth opening. But I said that babies were born to learn. And scientists like data about that. And so we went in and tested babies not 19 hours old, not 9 hours old, but literally 42 minutes old baby that young has never seen a tongue in her entire life. I remember vividly sitting down nose to nose with this little 42-minute old baby, poking out my tongue, and she poked her tongue out back. I opened and closed my mouth, and she did mouth opening in kind. This shows that babies are born social. They're born connected to us, and this is the root of our common humanity. Scientists are very interested in looking at the brain mechanisms that underlie imitation. This image shows a 14-month-old baby in an EEG cap with electrodes on it, and we are sensing the baby's brain changes as, they are, as she engages in imitation. We're very interested now in bringing this into the MEG machine and can't wait for our first dynamic images of the baby's brain as she engages in social imitation, looks at the person, at the object, at the person and the object, and then shows that joy at having achieved the end. We think that this will revolutionize and transform our understanding of social emotional learning even before the children go to school. Now I want to make a more of an explicit tie between all this research on early learning and education itself. Children are affected by culture and there are stereotypes in our culture about what kind of academic subjects certain children can do or not. We think this begins to affect the children. They internalize it and it can block their aspirations, change their goals and interests. We recently did a study on that and published it three months ago investigating the power of these cultural stereotypes. Let me give you an example. In American culture, there is, unfortunately, a stereotype 
that girls don't do math and boys do. It's not a reality, it's just a belief or a stereotype, but we think it affects the children. In the study, the results showed that children, of course, had a sense of gender identity, I'm a girl, as early as the preschool period. But the new information is that as early as second grade, children had already absorbed the American stereotype that girls don't do math and boys do. Now this is heartbreaking because all the research show on all math indicators that boys and girls do equally well at math at this early age. And one year later, by third grade, the girls are assimilating that and saying, I don't do math. The good news is that this stereotype doesn't affect every child, every girl in this culture, and it's not culturally universal. Singapore expects their, both their girls and their boys to excel in math. So what we want to do is begin a dialogue between scientists, policymakers, and teachers about how to change the stereotype in American culture and how to, to inoculate our children to protect them against it. I can wrap up and just give you a few take-home messages. Children are born to learn. They learn first and best from us, from people. They're paying attention to us and learning whether we know it or not. There are only 2,000 days between the newborn baby that you saw and when that child will show up in kindergarten. It is urgent that we use the best scientific information to make sure we support all our children so they succeed in school. Our children can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.